All right. Greetings everyone. Good morning from Indo Indonesia and welcome back to the 19th Indo Anesthesia 2022. So today we will start our week two of Indo Anesthesia. As you guys know, we will have four weeks every Saturday and Sunday until 6 of March. Uh, we will have all the interesting topics with uh, renowned faculty from all over the world. A gentle reminder, so you only actually to register once, so no need to register for every day. You can use the same link until the end of the symposium. Untuk teman-teman yang di Indonesia, diingatkan sekali lagi, linknya cukup didaftarkan sekali saja, tidak perlu mendaftar berkali-kali, nanti bisa menggunakan link yang sama. Lalu untuk teman-teman yang di Indonesia, ada tiga pemenang beruntung untuk door prize hari ini, jadi semua tolong aktif bertanya, nanti kita kasih pengumuman di uh, akhir sesi. So I think we should begin as we have all the speakers and we have nearly 300 participants already. The first session it will be about uh, perioperative medicine. I think this is very interesting. We will have three prominent speakers in their fields. Uh, we will have the first one is Dr. Philip Bickler from USA and the second one we will have uh, Professor Laura Clark from the US as well and last but not least we have Professor Stephen Gatt from Australia. So Professor uh, for Dr. Philip Bickler, he is the Chief of Neuroanesthesia in the Department of Anesthesia and the Perioperative Care in the UCSF and this morning he will discuss about pulse oximeter performance and skin pigmentation. So I would like to welcome, uh, you can start now. Great, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I guess it's eight o'clock on Saturday morning in yeah, Jakarta. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so thank and you for that. It's 8, 8 p.m. at your place now? It's uh, 5 p.m. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> You're just getting started on your day, and we're just wrapping up ours. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let's see here. Let's go to... How's that look, everyone? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. Let me go back to the beginning. So my topic today is on pulse oximetry. It's an update concerning what I think is one of the more interesting topics related to pulse oximetry. That is the, uh, the problem or potential problem of how skin pigment interacts with the accuracy and performance of pulse oximetry. And I wanna acknowledge all my collaborators um, across the world uh, over the last 30 years, uh, which have really uh, sustained these efforts and have, and these efforts have become particularly critical now that we have so many patients worldwide who are suffering from hypoxemia caused by the, by the COVID virus. So my goals uh, this morning are to describe the development of pulse oximetry and uh, how it came to be and, and how it came to be probably the most widely used monitor besides the thermometer. I'm going to describe how pulse oximeters uh, function, how they're calibrated. I'm going to talk then about um, the effects of skin pigment on pulse oximetry, what we know and what we don't know. I'm going to speak about the critical issue of missed hypoxemia in patients with dark skin and all the controversies that has uh, been generated because of that. Um, then I'm going to talk about some, some history because um, the issue of skin pigment in medicine is a particularly interesting one. And there's a big history on, um, on how we came to classify skin pigment and race and uh, its implications for um, the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, I'm then going to describe some of uh, my laboratory's experience uh, in testing and developing pulse oximeters and uh, in real, real world studies of errors in pulse oximetry. And finally, I'll wrap up with some discussion of some of the most significant problems that can produce errors in pulse oximetry measurements. So first of all, some basics. So as you know, um, the saturation of blood determines its color. This is a dramatic uh, effect and was one of the, um, the earliest things that was noted about, um, about the way that oxygen interacts with blood. It changes the blood's color. 
And this led to the development what, of, of what I have said is probably um, the most common medical monitor now on the planet, which is the, the pulse oximeter. It's exceeded only by the, um, probably by the thermometer as a, uh, as a uh, most used uh, medical device. Well, the color of, of uh, blood is dependent not so much on the partial pressure of oxygen, but on the saturation. So the color of blood varies with the saturation in almost a linear fashion. And that's a very convenient thing for measuring the saturation of blood. The modern era of oximetry dates back to the days of World War II, when uh, the allies in Europe had a problem because to avoid um, German anti-aircraft and, um, and uh, the Luftwaffe, um, Allied pilots were flying higher and higher. And the hypoxia that was experienced at altitude created a problem. So um, a group of, of scientists in the US and Europe um, wanted to develop an oximetry device that would allow the monitoring of the oxygen level in pilots to tell them when their oxygen levels were getting dangerously low and when they had to put on their supplemental oxygen. Um, the oxygen um, provided in these airplanes back in the days of World War II was not very advanced and the oxygen masks were uncomfortable, um, especially in, at, um, at low temperature. So Glenn M um, Milliken developed an ear oximeter and there's a picture of it on the right there. And in order to calibrate it, it had to squeeze the blood out, blood out of the ear. So that little clamp device there is used to uh, produce a basically a zero signal with no blood in the ear. Well, this is a very awkward um, type of device and you can see it hardly looks like something you'd wanna wear on your ear for very long. But um, it became um, you know, more or less widely used and it was the only way to non-invasively measure oxygen levels in the blood for the next 30 years. Um, you know, clinically, guessing the patient's oxygenation status by just looking at the color of their skin is very difficult. And Julius Comro um, here at UCSF um, did a study where he actually tried to quantify blood oxygen levels um, based on skin color. Of course, that only works in, in uh, light-skinned individuals. And in some individuals, the saturation could be as low as 80% and they still look like they had normal saturation. So the use of simply observational estimates of blood oxygen was not very um, satisfactory at all. Well, along came an engineer named Takuyo Oyagi at Neon, Corp uh, Neon Coden Corporation in Japan. And he was working in the 1960s on a new way of measuring blood oxygen levels. And he developed a method that used two wavelengths of light the red light and the infrared light that is still in use today. So modern oximeters basically are the same as that conceived by Oyagi back in the late 60s and early 70s. And on the left side is a picture of his first oximeter. The one on the right is one adopted in the US by a company called Nelcor. And of course, Nelcor pulse oximeters probably are the most widely used uh, type of pulse oximeter for uh, medical diagnosis um, worldwide. The one at the bottom is one that was developed in Japan um, by the Konica and Minolta Corporation. They of course made cameras, but they got into uh, pulse oximetry in the early days. And here's a picture of Dr. Oyagi. He, um, he passed away a few years ago, but before his death, he visited us in San Francisco and he was very interested in our hypoxia lab because we are still uh, doing studies for his company, Neon Coden Corporation out of Tokyo. And they, uh, to this day, continue to um, perfect the pulse oximeters that Dr. Oyagi um, developed um, almost, well, let's see. So that's 70, 50 years ago uh, or more. Okay, so pulse oximeters, um, as you know, um, have two wavelengths of light. They have a red and an infrared light signal, and they, work, and they work on the basis of measuring the pulsatile component of the red light signal versus the static component of the red light signal, divided by the same for infrared light. So it creates a dimensionless number 
called the R or the ratio, which is the AC at red light divided by the DC of uh, red light um, divided by the same for the infrared wavelength. And that produces a, um, a value that is uh, linearly related to saturation and can be calibrated. So all pulse oximeters work on this ratio. Um, and the nice thing about this ratio is it's, it's dimensionless and it's independent of a lot of the confounding factors that can interfere with pulse oximetry. So for example, it's um, in theory independent of the size of the individual's finger. And it also, it sh theoretically at least, should be independent of the subject's um, skin pigmentation. So this is a method that theoretically should be immune to a lot of the interfering uh, problems with other methods of non-invasive um, oxygen saturation that had um, preceded it. And um, you know, there are various tricks of the trade that come into play to build a pulse oximeter. You need to have good optics, so the good light emitting diodes to produce a pure wavelength of light. Um, the performance is dependent on the type of material that's used in the sensor. Um, and there's a, a wide variety of things that come into the engineering. But the basic concept that Oyagi envisioned 50 years ago is still in use today. So the, the, um, the graphic on the left shows this concept in, in a different form. Uh, light um, is modulated um, by the pulse of blood as um, it moves through the finger. And there's a, a component that, as I have said, is sort of the static component and the variable component. The variable component, again, is called the AC component. And um, at 660 and 940 nanometers, there's differential absorption of oxy and deoxy blood, as shown down in the right-hand uh, part of the diagram. So th this method depends on pulsatility, and it depends on um, adequate light signals. You can differentiate pulse oximetry from infrared tissue oximetry as shown in the figure in the upper right, where um, no pulsatility is involved and longer wavelengths of light are used. So with a, a, a typical infrared tissue oximeter, there's only infrared red wavelengths which penetrate tissue better, but there's no pulsatile signal involved in the analysis of tissue oximetry um, values. Okay, so I said that Pulse, pulse oximetry produces this dimension, dimensionless number that has to be calibrated. So in order to make a pulse oximeter, you have to be able to relate the light signals to a level of saturation in the human body. And that is done in a laboratory setting where the subject's oxygenation is controlled. And we do this by having the subjects breathe different levels of oxygen to produce different saturation uh, plateaus. And we do this in, the way, in a way that produces stability of saturation. And then uh, we draw blood samples. We place an arterial line in the subjects and blood samples are taken at each level of oxygen. And then the light signals that are obtained from the oximetry device under test can be calibrated to produce an accurate assessment of the blood saturation level. And this is the way it's always been done since the early days of pulse oximetry development. It's still necessary to do this. So human testing is at the center of accurate uh, pulse oximetry measurements. So data from a typical pulse oximetry study would look like this. So th these blue dots are when the blood draws are, are made. The gray lines are the um, saturation levels um, that are measured with a reference pulse oximeter device. So you can see the saturation decreasing or stepping down at different points during the test. On the bottom in red are the uh, subject's heart rate. So the heart rate of course goes up during hypoxia. That's part of our adaptation to diminished oxygen availability. The cardiovascular response being um, the most uh, important adaptation that humans have to, uh, to low oxygen. So data from a typical pulse oximeter uh, study could look like this, where you can correlate the, the saturation level measured by the pulse oximetry or SpO2 uh, versus the arterial blood saturation. And for a well-performing device, there's a high correlation between what's measured 
with the pulse oximeter and what's measured uh, in arterial blood. One way um, in which this uh, relationship is analyzed is depicted in the three graphs on the bottom. This is called a bland Altman analysis, where it presents the difference between what the pulse oximeter sees and what the true value in arterial blood is versus the saturation level. And this um, can show you the errors um, in uh, the, this method of pulse oximetry, and it's a widely used method for describing the errors and other types of medical monitors. And it's the standard for pulse oximetry assessment. In a, in a, with a uh, typical pulse oximeters um, um, have an error that's actually dependent on saturation. So pulse oximeters work really well at the high end of the saturation range, so shown on the horizontal axis here. But as the saturation drops, the error in oximetry increases. So pulse oximeters become less accurate at low saturation. Now we don't often care about this because the diagnosis of hypoxia is centered right around 90%. So if you think about it, the, the place where pulse oximeters really need to be accurate for clinical diagnosis is right around that critical level of 90% because we're confronted with the clinical question of, is this patient hypoxic or not? And if the a pulse oximeter is, ac is accurate or not down at 50% saturation, we don't so much care. What we really are focused on is the, is the performance right around 90, which is the threshold for diagnosis of, of hypoxemia. Okay, so when we talk about performance of any medical device, we use terms like uh, bias and precision. So a medical device can be um, not very accurate and not very precise, as illustrated in the upper left uh, target there. It can be accurate, but not precise. So accuracy is sort of the average error. If the average error is always the same, even though it's in error, that's said to be accurate, but it's not very precise because it misses the mark. Um, a medical device can also be not accurate, but very precise. So it gives you the wrong answer all of the time. The device is, preci is precise because it always gives you the same error, but it's not accurate because it's consistently off. And what we really want in a medical device is one that is both accurate and precise. We want it to consistently tell us the true value of saturation around 90%. And we wanted to do so with enough accuracy so that we can make that diagnosis. We wanna know if the patient's saturation is 93 or 87. That's a critical distinction, okay? Now about, about 20 years ago, we uh, started getting interested in the interaction of skin pigment with uh, pulse oximetry. And in 2005, we published what turned out to be a very seminal study, I think we found that uh, in black subjects, pulse oximeters tended to read too high. Now this was something that we had noticed in all our studies of how pulse oximeters function in the, in the uh, hypoxia laboratory, but it had, it had not really been um, at, um, carefully quantified before. And a lot of people were surprised by this. They said, oh, you know, dark skin, well, Dark skin looks like deoxygenated blood. So why wouldn't a pulse oximeter read too low in someone who has a lot of melanin in their skin? Well, just the opposite is true actually. And it's a, it's a property of the optics and the way in which the saturation is determined that, um, that melanin actually produces a bias in the positive direction. So the pulse oximeters, um, at the time of this study in 2005, tended to read too high in subjects with dark skin pigmentation. And we um, loaded the deck, so to speak. We picked very dark subjects and we compared them to very light skin subjects to describe this difference. And at the time we recommended that um, this error in pulse oximetry um, be disclosed by the manufacturers of pulse oximeters and they, that manufacturers would provide some warning about potential errors in um, their darkly pigmented patients. But I think you can, you can, I can honestly say we were pretty much ignored. So the problem lay fallow for about 15 to, to 20 years. Um, and the, the, the problem with pulse oximetry can be seen here. In the lower left, there's a, there's a chart of 
the uh, light absorption of melanin. And you can see that in the red light spectrum, the absorption of melanin varies with wavelength. And pulse oximeters, because they use light emitting diodes, they don't produce a pure wavelength of light. They actually produce sort of a bell curve shaped distribution of light. And because melanin absorbs uh, more red light at the shorter wavelengths, it produces a skew or a bias in the red light signal. And that's the basis for this issue. And human skin varies a lot in the um, reflectance and absorbance of light across uh, the spectrum. And you can see in the plot on the right how much it varies between um, um, Caucasian, Japanese, and Black African subjects. So this is a significant uh, potential issue for pulse oximetry. All right, well, along came COVID. And there was a, a sort of a seismic event in the pulse oximetry world in, um, in uh, 2020. A group of researchers at the University of Michigan led by Michael Schoding published results in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that in hospitalized black patients um, that pulse oximetry was missing the diagnosis of hypoxemia. And the, uh, the chart on the left is reproduced from his um, uh, paper in the New England Journal. And the gray shaded area on the bottom represents data points for which the pulse oximeter was missing the diagnosis of hypoxemia. So the arterial oxygen saturation there was below 88%, but the oxygen saturation on the pulse oximeter was sometimes as reading as high as 96. So hypoxemic patients were being misdiagnosed and it was disproportionately uh, occurring in black patients. Um, this caused uh, a pretty big stir. And subsequent to Schoding, there have been at least four other uh, papers that have found the same thing. There was one um, by B Valbuena in 2021. There's one uh, by Burnett, which is going to come out in anesthesiology um, shortly. And there's another one by, um, by Chesley from the University of Maryland or Johns Hopkins, I believe, that, sh that, uh, that shows the same problem. All these studies at different hospital systems in different locations have reported basically the same thing, that missed hypoxia is occurring, occurring disproportionately in black patients. Now, um, there's a few things um, that need to be um, discussed about this. The first is that all these are retrospective studies. So they're, they are uh, gleaned from electronic medical record data largely and um, they represent different patient populations. And there's a couple of critical things that um, just impossible to uh, control or even know about in retrospective studies. Um, the, the, the actual skin pigmentation of the subjects is not known. The conditions of measurement were not known. So um, sometimes the um, blood gases were obtained um, at different times than the, than the recording of the pulse oximetry reading. So there's a lot of um, issues here, but yet we have four large studies that basically show the same thing, that we have a problem with pulse oximetry. So there's been a lot of concern about this. So um, a couple of U.S. senators, um, Elizabeth Warren and Cory Booker, wrote a letter to the FDA and said, what is going on with pulse oximetry? We have a problem here. Um, this is a racial disparity in healthcare, which is encoded in a medical technology, which, which the FDA has approved and sanctioned. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of concern. So politicians were concerned, the public was concerned, there were a lot of articles in the popular press. And furthermore, um, global health NGOs were concerned because they were buying pulse oximeters for use in places like Africa. And they needed to know that the pulse oximeters that they were you know, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on in the context of um, providing pulse oximetry for COVID patients potentially were inaccurate. So there was a lot of, um, of, um, of discussion and concern and, um, and uh, just heat, I would say that, that was generated here. You know, and just to put all this in context, in the U.S. at least, there's some significant disparities in out outcomes from COVID. 
where um, the death rates um, for black uh, patients with COVID are higher than their representation in the population. Um, the, you know, I, it's unknown whether this is true um, in other countries, but in the US at least, where we have a lot of health disparities, um, you know, the impact of COVID has been disproportionately felt in communities of color. So the issue of accurate medical diagnosis in those communities is uh, of paramount importance. Okay, now I wanna just um, step back for a minute and um, provide a little bit of context on this issue of, of skin color and race. It's actually a really fascinating and, and in some ways sobering history. Um, it's shocking to know some of the, the facts related to the way in which skin color um, was interpreted. There was a scientist named Samuel Stanhor, Stanhope Smith who believed that black skin was caused by black bile. It was responsible not only for black skin, but it was associated with the emotional state of individuals with, with darkly pigmented skin. And, you know, statements like that were common. Um, you know, skin color was associated with all kinds of real or imagined um, racial traits. And the biological basis for skin pigmentation wasn't known really until the 20th century. And its impact on, um, on well, on, the, on, on human evolution was not really appreciated. So, you know, all humans have bias and skin color has been the primary means by which people have been classified into groups, you know, based on the Western scientific tradition. And historically, you know, labels of skin color were not neutral descriptors, but they connoted meaning that influenced the perce perception of the described groups. And I think you all know what I'm talking about here. I mean, it's really a, a part of our shared scientific tradition that's that in a lot of ways, deeply embarrassing, but it's also really important to understand where these concepts of skin color um, have come from and how they're classified and how they've, um, you know, until recent years been such an ingrained part of the Western scientific tradition. You know, Carl Linnaeus, the great um, phylogeneticist who came up with the genus and species way of describing um, species, you know, he classified humans into four groups. He called them um, Homo Americanus, Homo uh, Europaeus, Homo Asiaticus, and Homo Affer. And, and he described uh, these different uh, subspecies of humans based on just some ridiculous um, stereotypes. Um, and uh, I won't read them all to you, but, but you know, suffice to say that um, we would categorize his, um, his classification as deeply racist and uninformed. It's shocking to know that, um, that these existed uh, up until the modern day. You know, and the philosophers of the so-called enlightenment um, you know, imbued um, racial descriptors with, with not just physical manifestations, but they were associated with mental state and political and moral superiority or inferiority. Um, these are the, some of the traditions that have been promulgated um, in the so-called science of skin color. Anyway, I just needed to mention that because it's a fascinating history. Now I'm gonna take you back to um, the hypoxia laboratory where we have studied um, how uh, pulse oximeters perform. And as I said, what we do is we put arterial lines in and we make our human subjects hypoxic. They're all healthy human subjects, mostly young individuals. And um, we specifically recruit subjects with a wide variety of different um, skin pigmentation. So as to give information about how skin, skin pigment affects the performance of oximetry. Well, in, in the human um, laboratory environment, where everything is controlled, where you don't have all the variables of clinical medicine, we don't see the same errors that Schoding saw in, in black hospitalized patients. So the red square on the left shows no 
missed hypoxia diagnoses in data from the hypoxia lab. This, the, the similar red square on the right is from Shoding, where all these missed diagnoses of hypoxia. So although there are errors in pulse oximetry that, um, that, are, that persist, the magnitude of the error is smaller. So the question then is why um, is Shoding seeing these errors? What's, what's going on clinically that can produce these errors? Because understanding that is critical to using pulse oximetry uh, wisely and accurately. Well, one clue um, that we have come up with is that the perfusion index as seen by a pulse oximeter is a critical factor in determining error. And then the, the chart on the left shows an increase in bias at low perfusion index. And this was from a study that we did back in 2018 when we weren't really thinking yet about the problem of skin pigment and low perfusion index. This was a study with motion and, and, uh, and low perfusion. And interestingly, in our study, all our female subjects had low perfusion as defined by um, perfusion index less than two. And the errors in those subjects was much, much larger. So perfusion index was a, seems like a major um, um, cofactor in pulse oximeter errors. Well, more recent analyses of, um, of data from our laboratory have confirmed that. Here are data from what we call Fitzpatrick one and two classification. So these are in very lightly pigmented subjects. And the, um, the red circle shows the bias errors in, in the pulse oximetry uh, readings from these individuals where we obtained arterial blood samples and saw what the pulse oximeter was reading simultaneously. So there you can see there are a few, um, blood, uh, there are a few samples there at low perfusion where there are um, errors where the pulse oximeter is biased in a positive direction where it reads too high, but it's nothing like what you see in um, darkly pigmented subjects. And for some reason, the red circle doesn't show up on this and the, and the color of the plot doesn't look very good. But look at the lower part of the figure. There's a lot of pulse oximeter errors that are clustered at low perfusion in these darkly pigmented um, subjects. And actually this is for um, uh, not the most darkly pigmented subjects, but for uh, subjects that are intermediate uh, skin pigmentation. Here's the one I was looking for, sorry about that. Look at all the errors here in that red circle. So these are darkly pigmented subjects. It's a positive bias, so the error is positive. So these are, these are data points in which the pulse oximeter is reading too high. So even in the human lab where we control all these conditions, um, low perfusion is associated with pulse oximeter error. So that's a major clue potentially to what's going on clinically. And um, this is a, just a little bit more about how human skin pigment evolved. You know, we started off with, uh, with fur and as we evolved in losing the fur, we developed um, more darkly pigmented skin to, um, to avoid um, damage from ultraviolet radiation and, and so on. Well, one, so what's going on here? Why are we seeing low perfusion in our uh, patients or subjects with uh, darkly pigmented skin? Well, this is a really interesting um, potential explanation. And it relates to the, um, the degree of vasoconstriction that occurs in the skin as a function of race. And in, in these data were obtained by um, what's called a cold um, immersion test, where um, you measure the blood flow during immersion of a hand into cold water. And in um, subjects of African consent, uh, descent, the degree of vasoconstriction is much greater. So um, there seems to be a, uh, a racial difference in vasoconstriction. And that may occur during hypoxia as, as well. This is unknown, but it's something that we're interested in studying. So this, this issue of low perfusion may be genetically encoded and may, um, may be more than just skin pigment. It may be a factor that is um, associated with some of the other non-color effects of melanin and melanin metabolism. So that remains to be seen. So what um, our next steps are, um, is we are, we are planning a prospective study on pulse oximeter performance. And it's designed to overcome the problems that were present in those four retrospective studies that have been so um, uh, influential. 
And we're going to use an objective rather than self-reported uh, skin pigmentation scale, um, rather than racial uh, designation. We're going to make sure that pulse oximeters are reading under stable conditions and that we know uh, the perfusion index. But until we um, understand the problem of pulse oximeter errors um, in individuals with dark skin pigmentation, um, what we're going to have to do um, is understand that errors can occur. And if I could leave you with one um, message, it would be to pay attention to the subject's perfusion. That's the number one reason why pulse oximeters read inaccurately in the clinical environment. And simply warming the patient's hands or doing things to improve perfusion can greatly improve the performance of pulse oximetry. So maybe next year I'll have an update on what we, on what we are finding and uh, I can describe this, the, te the steps that uh, the FDA and other regulatory bodies are going to take to improve um, the performance of pulse oximeters so that they work better, better on everybody all over the world. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And um, as a parting slide, I just want to acknowledge all the people in my research group um, that have uh, worked so hard um, to make all this possible. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Will. It is uh, very interesting because in Indonesia, we also have a very wide variety of uh, skin color. So it's very interesting to discuss. Uh, so on to the next uh, speaker, we will have Professor uh, Laura Clark. Um, she will discuss about uh, diabetic patients as we see more and more uh, patients with diabetes. So I think it will be very interesting about uh, how we should tailor our perioperative approach for this group of patients. So yeah, uh, I think Laura, you can start. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. All right, well, I really, really miss being in Indonesia. This is not quite the same. Uh, and I was reading, I had a screen share thing come on and I've got a new place that I wanna suggest, not new for you, but new for me, Kat, is it? Kelly Mutu? Oh, Kelly Mutu, yeah. yeah. Kelly yeah. Mutu Lake. Yeah. yeah, that would be a nice place to go see, maybe, because some people could walk up there and some people can take a bus up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good idea. Applaud. Yes, I want to come back. Okay. Uh, so. I second that idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's two people will come to Jakarta next year, maybe. <laughs> so uh, I. Uh, thought that you might be interested in care of the diabetic patient uh, and uh, some of the new guidelines that have come out for taking care of these patients. I know that um, in Indonesia, the number of patients uh, with type 2 diabetes has been increasing and is expected uh, to continue uh, that that trend that you will see more and more. Uh, sugar is probably one of the most, uh, you can't ac actually call it a drug, uh, except it, I can confess that it's very addicting. Um, and uh, it's very difficult to regulate sugar just in normal people. And then when you can't actually metabolize it and use it, uh, it becomes a real problem. So with the um, Let me, there we go. Um, I don't know why it's not advanced. It's not wanting to advance except through there. So these are, I know you have pizza, uh, but this is a pizza to the extreme and some of these cups full of things, but it's not only uh, food uh, that causes an increase in glucose. So I thought uh, you might be interested to know on some of the things that we deal with as to what else can increase uh, glucose. And one of those that they found uh, is just purely the anatomic location of the surgery itself uh, with thoracic and abdominal surgery being the greatest increase in glucose, uh, but also very invasive procedures like uh, a pancreatectomy, like uh, going retro, retroperineal node dissections along with a big uh, 
dissection of the bowel, uh, that type of thing. And also, of course, interoperative fluids can. Also the type of anesthesia. Uh, there are higher levels of catecholamines, cortisol, and glucagon uh, with uh, volatile agents inhibiting insulin secretion, as well as uh, an increase in hepatic glucose production. So you got this coming from two sides that can actually increase the amount of glucose in your blood just based on the type of anesthesia. Also laparoscopic procedures uh, have been shown to decrease it, um, that, that an increase insulin resistance. So it'll decrease insulin resistance, meaning that it will increase the glucose in the blood because your insulin just doesn't work as well. They just can't function to the same degree. Now, all of these, I don't want you to get overexcited about, but these are just some trends to show you various ways uh, that glucose can increase besides with food. Uh, so what else might do it? Well, of course, we all realize all there's, there's all kinds of effects from surgical stress. Uh, the surgical stress causes the hormones, the catecholamines, glucagon, cortisol, and growth hormone to all increase. That's going to affect the pancreas with reduced insulin production. And the, uh, on this side is the gluconeogenesis because when this insulin is either not effective or not in enough level to work, then your body has to be feed itself some way. So that where, that's where it goes from the aerobic metabolism, so to speak, to the anaerobic, and it'll break down your muscle and fat. You have increased lipolysis, which leads to free fatty acids. The liver will have gluconeogenesis, and those will increase glucose production. Uh, skeletal muscle also, relative insulin resistance with those, and you'll get hyperglycemia. And we know that there's increased complications from having a high amount of glucose in your blood. On the cellular level, there's mitocardial injury, meaning that you're just, you know, you're the energy that your cells produce, they don't produce it as well. You have endothelial dysfunction that leads to the retinopathy, uh, some of the in it, kidney disease, uh, and uh, all the vascular compromise that occurs. You get immune dysregulation and superoxide generation, like all of those will affect how you can fight infection. So neutrophils can be impaired uh, by this overreaction of oxygen species, the free fatty acids, which all this leads to cellular damage and all these different complications that we get from high sugars. Now, this takes a long time of high sugars to talk about the retinopathy and that type of thing, but we can see increased infections right away in diabetic people. So it depends on the amount of time and to what degree that this occurs. And this is another little schema of showing what happens without insulin. If your pancreas isn't really producing it, you're going to go with this liver and adipose and muscle breakdown you have the body trying to take care of it with secreting more in the urine. But with that comes loss of water and electrolytes. You can't just excrete sugar on its own. So that's going to lead to dehydration, hypovolemia, and the important part of increasing lactate and acidosis in the body is going to fear, interfere with all your chemical reactions in the body and lead to the condition of diabetic ketoacidosis uh, that can be overt or covert. And I'm going to show you an example of that. So here's a uh, article that I thought you might be interested in on the importance, and this is an older one, not that old, 2013, but talking about what happens with an increased adverse effects among patients with diabetes if their glucose is higher than 180, they get increased infections. 
uh, all reoperative interventions are higher and even in hospital deaths are higher among patients with diabetes and even adverse events among patients without diabetes who happen to have some high sugar for some reason. Maybe just the stress of surgery. Maybe they have four or five things together. And so that's why we want to try to have worked really hard to try to control glucose in the perioperative setting in one way or another. And now we're finding out there's even some more implications that we'll talk about in a minute. I was talking about insulin resistance. The studies have shown that this insulin resistance is usually resolved by discharge, but it can last for up to nine to 21 days, three weeks after surgery. Uh, and in EROS protocols, which you're going to have another lecture on in a little bit, uh, that was one of the reasons in EROS protocols, they found people did better preoperatively if they were not in a starved state. Now that's talking about all comers, people with diabetes and without. So people without diabetes get into a starved state by obviously not eating. Well, what's important about diabetic patients are if they are withheld their insulin, they are now in a starved state, even though their sugar might be high. So that's an important concept to, to remember for later on in the lecture. So the type one are those that are prone to develop ketosis and acidosis due to a lack of insulin. Type two have more of a insulin resistant cells. The insulin is there, but it can't function. It's long been thought that uh, type two diabetes patients are not as ketosis prone. And in some sense of the word, that is true, uh, but now we're finding that type two diabetics, especially those that require insulin, are very ketotic prone, but they do not look like the type one or the juvenile type of diabetic when they're in DKA. They can look practically normal. And uh, I've had a patient just in the past month or so uh, that I was getting ready to discharge, and I happened to just go ahead and take a blood gas primarily to get glucose because our machine in the operating room, the iStat, uh, will give us glucose uh, measurement along with the pH and that type of thing. Well, lo and behold, I found out that his uh, pH was down to 7.2. And he had increased lactate and was essentially in a DKA, although he looked and felt by all intents and purposes, just fine. And I am perfectly certain that we discharge people in this type of state without realizing it because for a, there's a certain period of time that it's all chemical. All that you ever see is if you happen to test for it. Uh, and then, of course, if it's, if it's not corrected, if they don't get insulin and they don't get fed, then it gets into a regular serious sick uh, diabetic ketoacidosis. So there is a common mistake to manage type 1 patients like type 2 patients holding long-acting insulin if their glucose level is in the normal range. But we forget, and even if it's a little high, but uh, we forget that this glucose is really not available to the cells. And most of the time it's not real high, it's not real alarming, uh, but the patient is still be experiencing a starvation state. And why is that? It's because they're not eating and because they are not having insulin. So the goals for these people, we obviously want to avoid hypoglycemia. Uh, we want to prevent this state because it's catabolic. That's what gives them increased infections. Uh, we want to maintain a fluid and electrolyte balance so they are not 
urinating out big molecules of glucose along with other electrolytes and sugar. You have to really watch potassium in these people. And of course, we want to avoid marked hyperglycemia. So how much and to what level do we want to keep people? Uh, you'll see normal from somewhere from 60 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. That's the U.S. And I think um, that's something like seven. You have to correct me. I don't, it's around, uh, well, 140 is around 7.8 millimoles. Um, but I've got it uh, corrected over here. Um, tight control is no longer recommended. And somewhere between 80 and 180, which would be 4.7 to 10 in Indonesia. Uh, and I guess the rest of the world, except the United States. Uh, but that's the 80 to 180 for us. But 4.7, so you can just round that to 5 to 10 is the range where you want to keep people. And you want to try to not let it get above 10. Now, we don't recommend tight control anymore. And the problem with that is, is you can't exhibit any signs or symptoms under anesthesia. And uh, back in the last decade, which it was really the up and coming thing to have an insulin drip on everybody and then started out in ICU. And sure enough, uh, there were so many episodes of hypoglycemia uh, that it's no longer recommended to do that, only in circum certain circumstances. So what is recommended is what the guidelines that I've been able to find, uh, the American Diabetic Association uh, standards for care of the diabetic uh, modified it and re is, was recommending levels between 140 and 180. So even, those, even though those are higher than normal to prevent the episodes of hypoglycemia, because it's very easy to overshoot, especially if you're giving someone to insulin, someone insulin that they're normally not on insulin. Um, they said it's not harmful if it's in the 140 to 180 range. So you don't have to overdo it and try to get them down to 100. Uh, more stringent goals, though, may be necessary instead of 180 being upper limit, changing it to 140, which is 7.8. Uh, millimoles per liter. Uh, it may be appropriate for selected patients, such as how I've listed here, cardiac surgery patients, uh, those that uh, have acute ischemic cardiac or neurologic events, uh, and provided those targets can be achieved without significant hypoglycemia. So wouldn't it be wonderful if all surgeries would be at 7 to 9 a.m., uh, basically first cases? So that way you don't have to worry about them being starved at the night and starved during the day. Uh, and so there's uh, all type one diabetics and some type two will need insulin to cover this period based on your regular clock. And the easy way to remember this, I think, is that, and I'll say this a couple of times later, is that if you think this is surgery, is going to get this person back where they are going to be able to eat lunch, uh, you can pretty much keep things as normal on their normal regimen. And people always do better on their normal regimen. It's when it goes longer than that, that you need to adjust. And so there's new and emerging therapies uh, to help with that. And we'll talk about that. So here's a schema. Uh, the way most diabetics are treated is on a regimen of a short acting and an intermediate or long acting insulin. Some people get it one time a day and some people might get it from two to three times a day. I'm not gonna talk about an insulin pump here because I, I may be wrong, you can correct me, but I don't think there's a lot of insulin pumps that you're gonna be dealing with. Uh, we're seeing them more and more and more but uh, I thought I'd just leave that for another lecture in and of itself. So if they take their, uh, their regimen is one time a day, uh, one regimen is to give them one half to two thirds of their normal insulin. If they do it more than that, uh, pretty much it's one half uh, of what they would take. 
You would also run a D5W solution at 75 to 25 milliliters per hour. And you would check the blood glucose every two hours unless it's low. And if it's low, less than 100, then you're going to want to check it every hour. And you would treat hyperglycemia with short or rapid acting insulin. Now, here's an article that was from Journal of Clinical Anesthesia, when I, which I think uh, it, it's talking about type 2 diabetes patients that are on insulin. Uh, but it's the effect of their basal insulin dosage, what they have on their glucose concentration for ambulatory surgery patients, ones that are expected to go home. And they compared uh, taking what I just showed you of one half or two thirds, um, they felt that if they took, what they found in their study was that if they took 75% of their usual dose on the night before surgery, um, a higher proportion of them achieved target glucose on the day of surgery. Now, if they took their regular regimen, they were much more likely to have hypoglycemia. And so you need to watch out and know, ask them what they have taken. I usually ask them, what do your sugars usually run? And that'll tell me two things. If they know, that'll tell me what I'm shooting for or how it goes. If they don't know, then I know that they're really not taking care of themselves very well. And of course, we can always look at their hemoglobin A1C. But I wanted to mention the PK because, you know, we just said that we want to give rapid or fast acting insulin. Well, if you look at the most common ones, which are Lisboro, Aspart, uh, and regular insulin, their approximate onset of action is under 30 minutes. And these are from three to 15 minutes. But the IV PK of regular insulin with this immediate onset but it peaks in 30 minutes and it only lasts for about 10 minutes at the peak. Uh, and so it does not last long at all. And so you're, it's, you can't just give them that and then just think I've got it taken care of. It is a continual monitoring uh, frequently uh, to see what their insulin is. And remember, there's a problem also with absorption. So, the absorption of insulin in the surgical patient, especially if it's sub-Q, could be almost nil. Uh, it could be that they have vasoconstricted, like a normal surgical patient does. So you need to check often. Uh, usually there's an IV insulin infusion algorithm uh, that is very easy to find. If you need one, I can, I can send mine uh, that we use. Uh, but it, as I said, it's not common practice now. It's pretty rare in surgery uh, for us to use an insulin drip. And it is reserved only for long and complex procedures. So I wanted to stress on the type 2 diabetic who, is, who we are mistreating. Uh, and we don't need to put them into starvation. And there are some new drugs out there. Uh, but the mechanism, as we said, illness of surgery, no food, their MPO, their illness, they're stressed, uh, they're insulin deficient. And this is a drug we're going to talk about in a minute that works in that site. They have may or may not have ketones, uh, but if they're starved, they're going to have them and glucose in the blood. And with a delayed diagnosis, they can have an extreme base deficit. It can be minus 11. Uh, it can be really high. Uh, so they're going to be on type, uh, type 2's metformin and these GLP-1s. Uh, they neither really cause hypoglycemia. Uh, for both, you're going to see both uh, to hold it and to not hold it. Well, it really depends on, like I said, when they're going to eat. If they're going to eat at lunch, uh, you can just go ahead and leave it. If they're not, you should probably hold it. If their hemoglobin A1C is less than seven, uh, most will not need insulin for a short surgery. You'll still do the capillary blood glucose 
every two hours. And if it's high, do the short or rapid acting insulin. Now, first, for these longer surgeries, where they're missing food for the most of the day, you're going to omit any short acting or rapid acting insulin on the morning of surgery. But that doesn't mean that you eliminate everything. So for patients that take two types, you're going to give the longer acting, give one half to two thirds. Uh, and if they're taking it two or more times today, uh, one third to one half of the morning dose. Um, but mostly the long acting insulin. For those, you'll start an insulin infusion, uh, continue their usual basal infusion rate, uh, but you're going to start a D5W solution at 75 to 125 for an hour. And you also have to consider uh, adjustments if they are prone to hypoglycemia. So you got to take a good history of as much as you can find out about them. So for long and large procedures, IV insulin, glucose checks every hour or more for around 100. And it's better to use non-capillary blood if you can and send it to the lab. But if you don't have ready access, quick access to the result, uh, then just go ahead and do capillary blood finger sticks. Um, but if you have an iStat, do it that way. Uh, and then check electrolytes as well to see if they're moving. So I alluded to this new drug. Uh, so this new drug is oral. It's for type 2 diabetes, and it's called an SGLT2 inhibitor class. Uh, and this is a new class. I, we don't need to really go over the whole pharmacology of it because uh, I don't want to get bogged down in that. You can, you can read about that. Uh, but it does two things. Uh, what um, it's now this uh, can of glue is uh, it's a different name in the U.S. Of course, but it is now available in Indonesia as of October the eighth, twenty twenty. So you may start seeing this drug. Uh, Jardiance is one in the United States. There's the the uh, generic name of it. Uh, but the other thing this does besides that they found was, was why some of these people are on this, it has been shown to treat uh, the cardiomyopathy in diabetics. So it's the same thing. The heart is a muscle. And we've already talked about how it breaks down muscle when you're in a starvation state a lot or when you fluctuate. Well, the heart really is no different. And they think that's one of the reasons for the cardiomyopathy of the diabetic. So this little uh, illustration here shows the energy deprived heart, uh, untreated diabetic, hyperglycemic. Uh, you've got a smaller output. Uh, you have more ketones uh, with this drug. They found that it improved quite a bit. Uh, the site where it works is in the proximal tubule of the kidney. It inhibits the glucose co-transporter and it actually promotes uh, excretion of glucose. And here are the other areas that where things work in the kidney, but we're concentrating on this. So this is the SGL2 in inhibitor. Uh, here's the luminal side and here's the cell lining and interstitial fluid. So it is going to go, it's going to inhibit that so that it will be excreted. So catching the DKA in the OR and in PACU is one of the things that we really want to watch uh, besides the maintenance uh, that is uh, in the operating room. So now they're awake. Uh, they can have vague signs. So what are some of the signs that are typically talked about? Well, they can be drowsy. Oh, well, what kind of sign is that after you're waking up from anesthesia? How many of our patients in PACU are drowsy? Every one of them, right? 100%. So that's pretty vague for us. Uh, abdominal pain. If they've had abdominal surgery. Oh, well, there's another confounding thing. They can have pain from surgery. They don't quite know if it's abdominal or not uh, in most 
it's a scissor unless it's orthopedic or something, but they're going to have pain. Nausea and vomiting. How many of our patients have nausea and vomiting? Fatigue. They've just had anesthesia. Uh, so the point is, we're not going to be able to use these vague signs and they can look totally normal. They can look just like I'm looking today. And so the only way we're going to catch it is to routinely check both blood glucose and blood slash urine ketone levels or an arterial blood gas. So in the PACU, if the patient is unwell or is fasting, it's been a long case, or they've had uh, one of these drugs prior to surgery, it's really commonly uh, case reported that that's one of the side effects of this drug. These people are much more prone to developing diabetic ketoacidosis in PACU. And if you find that your ketones are greater than six millimoles per liter, that's an urgent uh, following with arterial blood gas. Put them on an insulin protocol, slowly lowering it, watching the potassium, giving them fluids. Uh, it's regular medical ICU care uh, of this patient. And here's the article that was from 2018, uh, looking at these case studies. So in many of these case reports, the glucose was a little over 200, but their base deficit is alarmingly. It's minus 19 to 24. Uh, and it can, at that oh, place, we can start getting into life-threatening type of things. It's quite serious. And so I thought it would be something to uh, bring to your attention uh, for this awareness that can happen most commonly, uh, more so with this drug. And I wanted to say a little bit about pregnancy and the diabetic, just to, as a review. Uh, if the person is hyperglycemic a lot during pregnancy, uh, it is associated with congenital defects. And during labor and delivery, the maternal glucose levels should be kept between that 70 and 140 range, uh, which is the uh, 4 to 10 uh, for you. Uh, they can be treated effectively with insulin pumps, but you have to remember that after delivery, insulin requirements fall really sharply. So you're going to decrease that insulin dose by a quarter to a half of the pre-delivery pre dose. Also remember, it's very important after C-section uh, in women who may not be allowed to eat for several hours. So they require much more care uh, than just looking at their sugar. So I hope this has been an, a little review for you, a little refresher. Uh, refresher course on this, a uh, little bit of new, uh, because we want to maintain safety uh, for these people and avoid, of course, hypoglycemia, but also more and more ketosis. The optimal perioperative level is somewhere between the five to 10 for you. Uh, if no drug therapy, uh, no therapy is required, you just want to check it when they first get there. If they're type two, Hold, the, a, hold uh, the AM dose, check levels. Uh, if they are on these drugs, I didn't mention, but forgot, I forgot to mention, you want to try to stop that three days before and kind of bridge them over, uh, just like you would if you were stopping an anticoagulant. Uh, if it's injectable insulin, you reduce the dose depending on how often they inject. Uh, for if they were to come with you in, with a pump, uh, the most common thing, if you're not dealing with those a lot, is to take them off the pump and put them on a sliding scale. It's not ideal. Uh, it's not what our goal is, uh, but that's the easiest thing to do. Uh, insulin drips for complex and long procedures. And I think that you're going to see new insulin preparations and devices, uh, such as pumps, uh, it will be continuing uh, because this is an inheritable trait and where people are living longer and longer and uh, we are genetically uh, having more diabetics uh, as every, every year as time goes by. 
So I hope this has been helpful and uh, thank you very much and uh, hope to see you soon. All right. And hope to see you soon in Kalimutu as well. <laughs> All right, Laura, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Actually, in Indonesia, um, I think most of the hospitals and laboratories also use milligrams. So, yeah. Uh, oh, do they? Yeah, 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 actually, actually. Okay. Some of them use millimoles, but most of them, I, I think they are using milligrams. Um, well, then that right. Google told me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Uh, there are already some questions in the Q&A uh, box. You can answer those. Uh, for the next speaker, we will have uh, Professor Stephen Gatt. Uh, I think uh, most of you already fo who already follow Indo Anesthesia for a while already know him. Uh, but today he will speak a slightly different. Normally, uh, Prof. Dad will talk about obstetric anesthesia, but right now today he, he will discuss about uh, geriatric anesthesia, and his presentation uh, will be about the how have we forgotten to tailor perioperative analgesia to the frail elderly. All right, uh, Stephen, put it in the full screen. Yeah. Uh Good morning, Salamat Pagi. I, uh, I am really glad to be talking about the subject today for many reasons. A, because I think that Indonesia is now starting to emerge into the ERAS type of, of surgery and playing a lot more time to the um, development of very tight perioperative screening. Uh, the question is, though, that we need to ask is, have we forgotten that we, in, in dealing with patients, that we need to tailor their, their uh, perioperative management? And we have done this very well in anesthesia. Almost, for example, we don't have drug dosages at all, really. We always titrate to effect. But can we do this, and should we do this to the frail elderly? These are my disclosures. As you see, I've been uh, involved with just about every drug and equipment company in the world, but nothing I have to say today has any of this. Now, when we, uh, when we uh, manage these patients, um, we, in the past, we have always felt that, you know, what is the value of chronological age? And we've always grouped patients as young elders or middle elders or old elders, and we've always used chronological age. I can put it to you that this is of no value whatsoever. We see so many patients who are older than 90 years old and in great condition. And we see so many 65 year olds who really are uh, in very bad shape. Now, when it comes to drug medication, I think there is a subclass of patients called the frail. And frailty is a syndrome. These are patients who have reduced functional reserves, they've got reduced resistance to assault, and this occurs because of a cumulative decline in the functional capacity of very many organs. The prevalence is interesting because in 65-year-olds plus, about 6 to 27% of these patients are, um, are of this but once you get to plus 80, then the current opinion in anesthesiology article shows a prevalence of up to 50% or close to 50% in aged patients. Now, what happens to function in increasing with increasing age? And we're going here from um, 30 years old to 90 years old at this end of the spectrum. And you can see that when it comes, sorry about that, when it comes, go away. When it comes to nerve conduction velocity, right, then you can see that the dec decline is very, very slow. So by age 80, most people are still sitting at about 88 percent of the nerve conduction velocity. Likewise, the BMR doesn't change greatly, and it sits at about 85. But when it comes to, for example, things like marathon record rate. We're now sitting at, at 45% at age 90, and at even less than that at about 38% with maximum breathing capacity. So there are some organs which seem to be more affected than others. And I think in that respect, 
Now, this comes from Jeff Cutfield in 2002, but he showed that body temperature, arterial pH, the number of no neurons total that you have, the resting pulse rate does not change greatly when you get into the 60 to 80 age uh, gap. But if you look at the bottom of the slide, when it comes to things like glomerular filtration rate, hepatic blood flow, maximum oxygen uptake, and so on, then the, decre the decrement can be to as, as low as 40 to 50%. So essentially, there is a decline in function with, with, with special age. The question though is, who are these frail people? And why is it important that we deal with these frail people? The problem with the frail people, first of all, is that when you pull out one block, like, like, uh, like take them to surgery, for example, or give them an anesthetic, is that the whole uh, pack of cards come, comes crumbling down, the whole tower comes crumbling down by doing a single um, uh, intervention. So do we need to know who these patients are? Absolutely, because to many, ex some are very obvious when you see them in the first place, but some are not as obvious as you think, and yet they might have severe decrements. And what do we do then with regards to their medication? How do we deal with these problems when, in these patients? Now, there are a number of ways of assessing frailty, right? And for example, the frailty syndromes, as they're known, are things like falls, you know, you need to ask them if they've had falls in the last 12 months. Continence, are they incontinent of urine or of feces? Are they confused at times? And so we often ask, you know, what the names are and so on. And then there's function. And function is measured using, for example, the Barthel Index, which are activities of daily living um, as being a very good way to find out what the daily living structures look like. These activities of daily living, shown on your bottom left-hand corner, are continence, independence using toiletry, independence in grooming and dressing, independent feeding, independent bathing, able to transfer from bread to walking, able to mobilize, able to climb stairs, and so on. There are other indices that deal not so much with the patients themselves, but with their carers, and we're not interested in that, obviously. Uh, but also, we need to have screening tests for post-operative delirium and post-operative de 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 declines in cognition. So uh, when you do your preoperative assessment, is the patient alert during the interview? We ask them age, date of birth, place, current year, and so on. Never ask them who the prime minister or the president is, because that changes too often. Uh, test their attention, um, and also ask the carer or the patient accompanying, person accompanying them, as what has been happening in the last few weeks. The fragile years are very important because the frail elderly, right, are particularly in Indonesian anesthesia at great risk. And giving an anesthetic to these patients is not as interesting as you might otherwise think. Um, I, I feel that uh, in many ways, I feel that uh, it is quite important, for example, in the Indonesian context, that in the 1950s, the mean age of patients was 29 years. In 2050, we, this is the mean year, mean, median age, we expect the median age to be 37.4 years for your population. So there's a continuously increasing uh, el more elderly patients and possibly some of them will be within these groups. We need to identify those who are more likely to develop cognitive dysfunction after surgery and acute confusional states. Why? Because we don't want to have a perfectly successful surgery and anesthesia, but then they can never go back home again because they're now confused and delirious and they've had cognitive decline and now need to be placed in a nursing home. Again, our hemodynamic instability is something that we need to identify in these patients. We need to then identify and implement a strategy to minimize these risks. And that's what I guess what I'll be talking to you about today with special, with special reference as, you know, to how we go about making this better for these patients.
I think, for example, for anesthesia, I think the modified frailty index, what is known as the MFI 11, uh, is a very good way to go about deciding whether these are just frail or even pre-frail, whether they are frail or they are seriously frail. Perfectly easy set of set of um, um, set of indices. You can score them yes or no. Each one of these. If you divide the number by eleven, you then get a index at minus 0.09 of pre-frail, of 0.18 of frail, and 0.27 for seriously frail. And these are. Do they have a history of diabetes? Dr. Clark has just shown you you know, how to, how to do all this assessment, uh, congestive cardiac failure, hypertensive, but on medication, if they've had previous TIAs or CVA, if they have a functional status of two, preferably measured a long time before the surgery rather than on the day of surgery, a history of myocardial infarct, of uh, peripheral vascular disease or rest pain, history of CVA with neurological deficit, history of uh, pulmonary disease or pneumonia, and people who have had cardiac surgery, angina, cardiac stenting, va uh, valvular uh, repairs, and so on, and those who have impaired sensorium. So you give them either a one or a zero for each of these, divide by 11, and that gives you your modified uh, frailty index. Or, And I think that this should be routine for all patients. Another test which I like very much because it's so easy to perform is what is known as the TUG. And the tug is the timed up and go test. And the timed up and go test, you put, all you need is a chair. You need something that looks a bit like this, right? Something that you can actually put on the floor at a distance of three meters. And all you ask the patient is to sit first. Now, they want to go from sitting to standing. They walk three meters. They turn around the post or the marker or whatever, the other chair you've got. You walk back three meters and sit down. Now, this tests a huge number of things. First of all, they, they're testing it that they've heard you, that they're not blind enough so that they can't even get there. It tests whether you, they haven't understood the instruction. It, it, uh, it tests whether they can process the instruction and then complete it. And then all you have to do is measure the time it takes. And if it's more than 15 seconds to get up, walk three meters, stand around the post, and come back and sit on their chair, is you can actually say that these are frail patients that require further assessment. Now, if you look at things in perspective, if you look at things over time, this, this data I compiled in about, uh, it, this is England, and it comes from Bro in 2015, and it showed that in the United Kingdom, right, between, between the era of 1541, right, to well beyond that, to 2241, the percentage of elderly patients from 1541, 1641, 1741, 1841, 1941, and then we come to our era. So, for example, in my lifetime, if I live from 1952 to 2024, I can see that if I was assessing this in 2015, the percentage of patients that had gone from being seven percent of the total population had already risen to about 15, almost 16 percent of the total population. At the time when I die, 2024, for example, it would have risen to 20 percent. And if I actually survive to 2041, which would be not too bad, uh, then I can say that, you know, that be, there'll be at least 22 percent, 21, 22 percent of patients. And this applies, I'm sure, to you in Indonesia as well. Now, I've already shown you these methods of assessing frail patients. Uh, I think that once you know that you have a frail patients, then what do you do? And luckily in your country, you are now in the era of ERAS. You are doing a lot of prehabilitation on your patients. You do recognize there are some patients who are frail or fragile, and we want to do something preoperatively to transfer them from fragile to agile if we possibly can. And we do this in the ERAS protocols in four different ways. We try and produce functional improvement. We try and give them nutritional adjustment and support. We try and do stress management and lifestyle modifications. And this is the way most of us will do it. For example, in function, 
We give them prescriptions for exercise. We supervise movement. We increase the amount of movement that they do. If they're still in the homes, we provide home support so that they can actually get better before they go to surgery. Nobody would dream of going to the Olympics without doing a bit of, uh, a bit of training beforehand. And here we are doing absolutely major surgery and doing nothing. And this concept has been going now for 40 years, uh, thanks to Heinrich Kellett and others. With nutrition, it's quite easy because basically we can give them not only dietary advice, but we can do things like giving them supplementation proteins, for example. Uh, protein can be bought in cans for, for all the kids going to the gym. Why can't they be giving to elderly patients? Um, again, to make sure that they've got a, a, a fair amount of protein on board. Can we adjust the vitamins? Can we adjust their electrolytes? Can we adjust especially vitamin B in the context of post-operative cognitive dysfunction? And can we give in other forms of nutritional support? In terms of lifestyle, again, many of these patients, for example, my mother was one of these, she kept smoking until she died, basically, right? But in these patients having surgery, the cessation of smoking for even a month before surgery, and again, with alcoholics, of giving them alcohol advice and reducing alcohol, and of, for example, using CPAP uh, for sleep apneas and so on, I think those sort of lifestyle things can make a big difference into post-operative management of these patients. We need to have the psychosocial support. We need to reduce reduction in some of them. And we need to teach them how to do relaxation techniques. Anesthetists in general, if you look at the top uh, upper quarter of this, are always very good at doing good quality anesthesia, as efficient as possible, giving a good service and a reliable service. So our whole lives is actually, is actually uh, centered around doing the best for our customer, where the customer is not only the surgeon, but also or the service, but also the patient. When it comes to the frail elderly, of course, it's like walking on eggshells. Uh, you want to do all these things. You want to give the quality and the efficiency and the reliability, but you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs sometimes, right? So that we now need to start tailoring the anesthetic technique to the frail elderly. We want to start tailoring intra and post op analgesia to the frail elderly. All of these things become very, very important, you know, when it comes to managing these patients. Luckily, we now have a few star drugs, which we can easily use. For example, when it comes to drugs, we need to find drugs that, are, that break down spontaneously, for example, without needing kidneys and livers. And now we have remimazolam, we have remifentanil, drugs like these, right? We want to use reversible drugs. So we have rocuronium and vecuronium, which we can use with Sogamidex and get very adequate reversal within minutes of finishing an anesthetic. So that there is no drug left, basically, with it, you know, within finishing an anesthetic. We have high potency agents. The non-depolarizing agents, for example, are incredibly potent agents. We have agents that can be cleared rapidly, like the inhalation agents. And we always argue on this ourselves as to which is best, but all of them really are very, very good. Again, we don't want to use agents which are likely to produce drowsiness, like nausea and vomiting, post-operative uh, delirium, post-operative cognitive decline. And so we opt for things like paracetamol instead of using opioids, for example. We don't use phenotiazines. We don't use benzodiazepines, though, of course, now we have the great exception of having a benzodiazepine, which also breaks down spontaneously. We want to use non-opioid oral analgesics in the post-operative period. So we already have the armamentarium to do all this very effectively. If you look at perioperative pain relief and think of it in a, in a, in a healthy patient as to the package, preoperatively, you can do preemptive analgesia. But again, in these patients, we don't particularly want to use drugs like morphine, alfentanil, fentanyl, and so on. But on the other hand, we also want, don't want to use uh, NSAIDs if possible. So, but we might be able to use coccyps, for example, in these patients. Intraoperatively, we don't particularly want to use um, drugs like, uh, like morphine, for example, in big doses especially, right? But on the other hand, we do have very many intraoperative intravenous paracetamol, paracoxib, ketamine, and so on. Again, ketamine, not a great agent to use in these agents. And then postoperatively, we have a whole bunch of things which can produce pain, 
you know, intra-articular uh, infusions of local anesthetics, pain buster soakers, um, uh, uh, intravenous paracetamol, and so on. You know, you know, PCEA, where the patients give themselves, if they are able to do so in the frail, give themselves their own tops for epidural analgesia, for example, or extended release morphine, for example, for use in the uh, neuraxial and neuraxial blocks. Now, one of the great beauties since 2000 and say 10, 11, 12, has been that we have an absolutely fantastic intravenous agent for all the receptors that, that modify pain. We have ketamine as an, an MDA antagonist, intravenous. We have intravenous paracoxib as a COX-2 antagonist. We have ibuprofen, and we'll come to paracoxib in a moment. Uh, we have uh, ibuprofen in the NSAIDs group. We have central COX-3S uh, blockers like paracetamol. We have opioids. We have the noradrenaline intravenously. We have all the agents like tramadol, which are uh, noradrenaline and 5-hydroxytryptamine antagonists. And on top of that, we can then add to get better analgesia and reduce side effects to local anesthetics. So effectively, in the end, we have the whole box and dice to do a great job with these frail elderly patients. I think that there are a number of situations in the frail elderly that are marriages made in heaven. For example, the combination of propofol in small dose with remifentanil, which breaks down spontaneously, and propofol, of course, being longer, and then a rocuronium infusion, for example, uh, for, uh, for muscle relaxants reversed with stochamidex. The preloaded propofol in a dip refuser syringe driver using the Marsh algorithm, again, a marriage made in heaven. You can actually titrate to, with great accuracy the levels of propofol that you have. The same with, with remifentanil, a pre-programmed remifuser using the Minto algorithm, and now we can actually give remifentanil accurately. We all have syringe drivers with intravenous line back check valves. We have three-way tap anti-reflux valves. Again, another marriage made in heaven. And again, we have agents like Sugamadex, which can be used to, re to reverse. So this is my anesthesia heaven, basically, for the very frail elderly patients. Ultra-short-acting drugs, breakdown spontaneously, reversible. You know, you can't get better than that. Remifentanil is a good example of this. You know, why is it so brilliant? Because basically it gives no hangover, right? It, it breaks down by esterous cleavage spontaneously. It is ultra short acting. We can get it up to steady state very rapidly using these pumps. There is no target organ, basically. And I, I, I apologize for the, for the misprint over there with target. We don't have a, a kidney or a liver that is needed to metabolize these drugs. They have no uh, active metabolites of their own. They have ultra high potency. Remy is eight times more potent than alfentanil and gives us excellent analgesia. So very good for intraoperative analgesia in these patients. On top of that, if you use it well, it gives you great analgesia, right? Better than fentanyl or alfentanil. It has, you won't get chest wall rigidity if you're combining it with muscle relaxants, no nausea and vomiting, no ventilation depression, perhaps a mild bradycardia, Yes, but that's sometimes used to advantage in our case when you're doing massive surgery. And so basically, trip, if, you, if, you, if you add to these things like ventilation and non-depolarizing muscle relaxation, very good for the elderly patients. Unfortunately for us, most of the patients presenting for surgery have a number of drugs that they're already on. For example, in 65-year-olds or higher, on your left-hand side, you have the likelihood of a patient needing one of these drugs. Usually it means needing one of these drugs plus more. For example, drugs for gastric irritability or peptic ulcers. 48% of 65-year-olds plus are receiving these medications. Antithrombotics, right? Uh, HMG co CoA reductase inhibitors, NSAIDs, selective beta blockers. All of these, right, are... are, uh, are in most patients coming who are more than 65 years old. We aren't even dealing with that. We're dealing with the frail ones, even more so. And the ones on the right are the ones where there's an 18 to 25% likelihood of getting one of these drugs. Now, these are from my own people in at the nursing home. And these are the comorbidities 
in Maltese senior citizens living in Sydney. And you can see that these people have not one disease, but they have many comorbidities, arthritis, diabetes, smoking, blindness, deafness, reduced mobility, and so on. So basically, we're not dealing now with polypharmacy only. We're also dealing with polypharmacy in a frail patient with multiple comorbidities. Having said that, for example, my Maltese speakers in Sydney are 97% more than 65 years old, do their own bathing, feeding, and dressing, their continent, they're 94% cognitively intact, 90% of them are freely mobile, and some of them leave, live with their children, 60%, and provide support to others. So effectively, either to a spouse or to somebody else. Now, remember that pain is different pain profiles apply, especially using the ERAS pathways, to different procedures, because we're dealing here with different types of pain, different pain intensities, different locations of pain, and definite different risk benefits using the analgesic techniques that we're going to use. So effectively, it is hard to generalize as to what is the best technique to use overall. Again, postoperative pain has so many components to it. There's the deep somatic pain from muscle, fish, fascia, and ligament that's being cut, perhaps. You have nociceptor sensitization in these situations. You have referred pain. You have muscle spasm producing reflex responses and postoperative pain. You have cutaneous uh, sens uh, somatic pain. Uh, you have cortical response in different patients. And of course, you have pain from the organs themselves. So effectively, postoperative pain is a big mishmash of things. Now, in your role, whenever you read ERAS protocols, even in young healthy patients, preoperatively they say avoid wherever possible, the administration of opioids. These do bad things to patients. They have high side effect profiles. So we try to give non-opioid analgesia preoperatively. Again, in all, again, intraoperatively, we try not to load them up with these uh, very potent, but uh, sadly, uh, very high side effect profile including respiratory depression, including cognitive decline, including delirium postoperatively. And the same happens post-off. We all know that producing bad pain management will do a number of bad things. It causes a number of clinical and psychological changes. You get decreased mobilization of the patients, and then you get increased risk of DVT, pulmonary embolus, myocardial infarction, coronary ischemia, and so on. And these do things like kill patients or produce mobility, longer hospital stays, an increased number of readmissions, a decreased quality of life in this frail elderly to the point of perhaps something sending straight, them straight off to a, uh, to a uh, nursing home or something like that, decreased patient satisfaction and increased health costs. So effectively, we need to manage pain well. We also don't want any pain in these patients to go from intraoperative pain to post-operative pain, to chronic pain syndromes. And again, this is a complex thing, even in the healthy patient. In the, in the frail uh, patients, it is less likely to happen, as it turns out, that, that basically very few frail elderly patients will go from a, 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 into a chronic pain syndrome type situation. So to end all of this, uh, we need to tailor make our analgesia by adding regional anesthesia techniques, by, uh, um, by reducing our drugs, by stopping polypharmacy. So what is the job of the anesthetist in this? First of all, in the preoperative period, right? I think you want to do, uh, you want to ensure that the polypharmacy is, is ended. You know, a 70 or 70 year old, old um, person, is 9.2% likely, right, to have, oh, sorry, no, it's, it's receiving at least nine drugs. Once they get to 95-year-olds, preoperatively, they're receiving more than 11 drugs. Drug interactions, we know a lot about this. We know how drugs interact with anesthetic agents. We know how drugs interact with analgesics. We know which drugs to stop. And then many of these patients have 
inappropriate drugs being given to them. They go to the cardiologist and he gives them the cardiac agents. He gives them the ACE inhibitors. He gives them the beta blockers. He gives them the uh, calcium channel blockers and so on. So we need to de-prescribe these patients. We need to actually remove the agents, right? Remembering that in the frail elderly, these drugs often have very limited uh, benefits. You know, if you're 94 years old, do you need to be completely anticoagulated? Do you need to be, and so it goes on, right? Okay, it will reduce the incidence of strokes and so on. But if they have poor quality of life in the third place, what is the point of giving them these agents? I thank you very much for listening to my ramblings. Terima uh, Makasi atas perhatiananda. I hope that there'll be some interesting questions in a few minutes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so we have a few minutes uh, for question and answer, but I noticed actually uh, Phil and Laura already answered some of the questions. So I think something that uh, I would address to Phil is that um, what do you think uh, about this relationship about skin pigmentation and the saturation? How does it affect our approach in dealing with our patients? Like, for example, uh, do we have to tailor our uh, approach for, you know, darker skin tones or, yeah? Well, uh, thank you for the question. Um, that's, that's the current challenge because we know that pulse oximeters can read falsely high in patients with very, very darkly pigmented skin. And uh, based on current knowledge, um, it's difficult to predict in what patients that will occur. But the one factor that I would call your attention to is the, the amount of perfusion or the perfusion index. Um, and uh, the errors are likely much larger at low perfusion. So that's something to be aware of. If the perfusion index is less than 2% of the total pulse oximeter signal, that's associated with the greatest errors. And that's where you've got to be careful. So you, don't, you can't always believe the pulse oximeter if it's reading high uh, in a patient with darkly pigmented skin who has low perfusion. Can I ask Phil a question as well, please, Chris? Uh, and this is, Phil, how do you propose to measure perfusion when it comes to doing your next study, basically, where you will look at uh, skin perfusion or wherever the oximeter is. And should we, in the meantime, while you've produced your results, start measuring all oximetry, for example, with a warm blanket wrapped around the fingers, or perhaps produce some sort of muff that you can put over your hand while we're doing the pulse oximetry readings in all patients anyway? You know, well, we're saying, you know. Yeah, so, not all pulse oximeters, in fact, a very few of them actually give you a perfusion index. Yeah. So, um, you know, the Massimo pulse oximeters will display that. And then some of the Nelcors will. The Nelcors measure it, but they don't often display it. And it's difficult to set them up so you can actually see what the perfusion index is. And I can tell you for sure that none of the inexpensive low cost pulse oximeters, including the ones, um, distributed by, by uh, the Lifebox Foundation show perfusion index. So one of, the, one of the regulatory changes that we've proposed is that all medical grade pulse oximeters display perfusion index. So the user has um, some indication about the potential for inaccuracy. So that's should maybe go, a regulatory change. Should we go one better? Should we now start to develop a, 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 an algorithm where once the perfusion index is known, there is an adjustment made to the, to, the, to the display of the oximeter reading based on the perfusion index? It would sound to me to be very simple to do, uh, you know, in terms of the, the, the mechanics in the box, basically, right? Uh, to yes. actually make an adjustment at all times, which uh, will adjust... Definitely which you could also adjust for skin color if you wanted to, I guess. Uh, yes, and we've proposed that to the International Standards Organization. So the International Standards Organization Committee on, uh, on Oximetry greatly influences the US FDA and other um, similar agencies worldwide. And that is a specific recommendation that we've, um, we've uh, made. However, um, we don't have quite enough data to 
um, to press that issue in terms of regulation. But um, within a year or so, I think we will. And, um, and perhaps we'll, that will be a change that will improve pulse oximetry for all of us. All right. Please. I have a question too, yeah. along yeah. those lines. I'm, I'm personally trying to be a crusader in changing induction practices and not routinely using phenylephrine on induction uh, and trying to, I know perfusion is not synonymous with co cardiac output, but they're certainly linked. So I'm trying to not decrease the cardiac output by overdoing induction and doing a milligram per kilogram basis of induction instead of just looking and seeing what they need by using uh, a BIS monitor or something like that. Uh, but as that is a preface, uh, do you think that uh, the pulse oximeter, I mean, how, how much is the pulse oximeter affected by phenylephrine dosages uh, and a constant phenylephrine infusion in a lot of cases? That's a great question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I always tell our residents that, uh, that the use of phenylephrine is probably not weakness. the best, is not the best choice to correct, correct the problem of overzealous anesthetic drugs. I mean, a, a drug like ephedrine or norepinephrine, uh, addresses the fundamental problem more directly than giving a vasoconstrictor, right? Because the, what the, uh, what the, uh, it, induction drugs have largely done is to decrease cardiac output. And that's not addressed by phenylephrine at all, as you, as you said. Um, but your question was about what phenylephrine does to pulse oximetry. And um, that's a complicated one because under anesthesia, you have conflicting influences. You have the vaso largely vasodilating effects of the anesthetics on peripheral perfusion. I mean, if you feel, the war you feel the hands of your patients, before induction, they're cold. After induction, they're warm because of redistribution of blood flow from the core to the periphery. So just giving anesthesia counteracts some of the uh, effects that would impair pulse oximeter function. But uh, where that balance is, is going to depend on the patient and on the drugs and on a whole bunch of other factors. So I, I can't give you a precise answer, sorry. Thank you. All great, right. great, great talk, both, both of you. Really enjoy it. Yes, Steve. Can I ask Laura? Laura, in this era where you can actually measure blood sugar continuously, and many of our fragile um, diabetics all have their little buttons, and they can read it directly off their off their smartwatch or their smartphone or the uh, smartphone uh, or the watch or the laptop and so on. Isn't the time in anesthesia? that we actually measure blood sugar. I know that the sensors are expensive. They are, in Australia, they would be $150 Australian, so I guess about $120, $130 US. Should we give up this whole concept in, that we've had in the past, right, uh, of actually just measuring hourly blood sugars? You know what I mean? These are post-operative patients. We measure everything else. We measure temperature. We measure pressures and so on continuously. Why don't we have an extra channel on our, on, on our monitoring that measures blood sugars? That's, that's, again, an excellent point. By the time we do four or five blood sugars, we could have bought a sensor. Correct. Um, but uh, I think part of the problem is they, you know, acetaminophen messes them up. Uh, <laughs> they, they can't read well if you give your paracetamol. Um, the other is a lot of times they're, there we have the vasoconstriction it hasn't really been it's it's so new uh, that it really hasn't been studied that extensively in anesthesia you can't uh, you don't know what kind of flow it, the it gets different constriction so it, they don't know really how accurate it is under anesthesia um i the people that use them uh they're they're wonderful but I just don't think we know that much about it. But in an ideal world, when uh, researchers start figuring this out a lot better, uh, then uh, I think, yes, that would be the ideal way, just like continuous hemoglobin monitoring. 
As a diabetic myself and one who has used these for a whole month in all sorts of different conditions, I used to go swimming with this plastic thing. You know, <laughs> fa- fa- fantastic, fantastic. You know, it's, it's you put it there, uh, it lasts a month and then you chuck it away because it's too tatty at that stage. But but the, the, the results when compared to my blood sugar monitors, for example, is fantastic. I can't say it. The same applies, for example, to HbA1c's, right? Yeah. If you if you go to a gym meant for diabetics, they will actually measure your HbA1c every time you enter the gym. It's a point of care device. It's sitting next to you know, it's sitting in the gym itself. It's not uh, you know, uh, and the same with ketones. Nowadays, most blood sugar monitors monitor not only your blood sugar but also monitor your ketone at the same time. And I don't know if there's any direct devices that do it continuously, right? But nevertheless, the measurement of HbA1c, fructosamine, uh, and and uh, and keto- ketonemia, and some in some situations beta hydroxybutyric acids and so on, is really you know become a very commonplace situation in wards that deal with diabetics all the time. Time is up. Uh, I think I think we've missed out on anesthesia. Time is up. Oh, we got a hush. Okay. So, 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 so what? You think we're going to okay. stop talking? <laughs> <laughs> so actually, Steve, uh, there are a few questions already for you in the uh, Q&A. Um, right. While we are starting for the next event, uh, the next session, you can answer those questions in the Q&A. Again, mm-hmm. I would like to thank uh, Phil, Laura, and Steve for a very nice presentation, very nice discussion. Uh, but unfortunately, we are running out of uh, time as we have Alex and YK already here. <laughs> As uh, Laura already mentioned, hopefully next year we see each other in Kalimutu. Um, <laughs> so guys, um, stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, thank you very much and good evening for uh, Phil and Laura. And good afternoon for uh, Steve. <laughs> Great thank seeing you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Until next year. Yes. In Kalimutu. <laughs> Kalimutu. <laughs>